Hello and welcome to Chapter 8, Business Analytics. Uh, this is part of the ISOL 536 Security Architecture and Design course. My name is Dr. Alan Dennis. I am your instructor. Chapter 8 focuses on the security concerns related to business analytics. Uh, it starts with a discussion of uh, the architecture that's involved, uh, the threats that may be associated with the activity itself and the architecture, the various attack services, including an enumeration of those attack services, mitigation, and how we're going to manage those risks associated uh, with the potential items, administrative controls, and then we'll close with requirements. Jumping right into the architecture, the, the beginning is to understand, well, what is data analytics and what is data science? So the, the two terms are oftentimes used interchangeably, but they have somewhat of a, a different sort of uh, definition. Data science, I would view as being a component of analytics, data analytics. And in particular, it's a more potentially uh, mathematically based, statistically based, or um, uh, algorithmic approach beyond just simple analytics, which may include simply reporting, right? So the basic idea of data science is to be able to extract knowledge from data. That is kind of the goal of a lot of types of analytics. Data mining is a particular type of extraction. Generally speaking, data mining involves a database. So it's essentially applying data science to data that's housed inside of a database. Uh, or uh, using potentially machine learning approaches, which is a, a subset yet of data science related to artificial intelligence. Anyway, uh, like many organizations, our fictitious organization feels the need to try to extract information from their data. Uh, so they're trying to get a holistic view of the, the health of the business uh, and getting outside of um, potentially challenges that may be slowing them down. Jumping into the next slide, we'll talk a bit about kind of the the architecture of that solution uh, and potentially some of the unique challenges that may be associated with analytic systems. So drilling into figure 8.1, the basic architecture, the data analytics, uh, business intelligence, uh, th those words also are oftentimes inter interspersed with each other. They mean slightly different things. Again, business intelligence might be a portion of data anal analysis and data analytics. But the basic idea is there's a system out here that does some analysis of data. And it's associated with, obviously, there's got to be some identity going on over inside of identity management and so on. And then we've got our security monitoring and events kind of box over here to the side. But all the interesting stuff's over here. Um, and in this diagram, they're showing uh, there's this concept of internal presentations. Uh, there's metadata, and metadata is essential uh, within an analytics environment. Metadata is data about data. So it tells you where data might be, uh, who did what to the data. So there's this concept of data lineage that comes to play whenever you're doing analytics, um, and so on. And then, generally speaking, analytic systems need to talk to existing business systems so they gather data. Sometimes, as, de as depicted here, they go directly to the systems themselves. Sometimes they'll go straight to the data, which is not shown here. Uh, as a security architect, you can probably think of the challenges with both of those approaches and so and the decisions that might go into making those decisions. And this is essentially the data flow diagram. So it's showing that data is coming from potentially various locations uh, and flowing throughout the system. Drilling in a little bit more, uh, and this is the part of the slide that I mentioned that is kind of the important bit, right? So talking about the business intelligence system itself. Um, and maybe it's a little easier to understand because we're looking at less stuff and the stuff is focused on the, the topic that we're talking about. And what you see right there is an example of potentially drilling in in this case via PowerPoint, right, into a, a layer of abstraction. So you're basically going in for more detail and removing things that might be distracting. And also an interesting thing with this uh, this diagram is that it's uh, the text says that um, 
uh, business analytics listens to the message bus. And so this tells you an important thing about the way that this author diagrams their flows. Generally speaking, the arrows go the other way, because if you're listening, you're not originating. And this, this arc is by a lot of people interpreted to be because the arrow is pointing at the bus, I would probably initially assume that that is sending a message to the message bus. The point of all that is that you may want to have early on in maybe it's a first slide if for some reason you adopted this um this architectural approach denote that the where the arrowhead is considered the source um versus the destination because as this is written right now it kind of looks like it's pushing data into the databases probably not something that you would want to do so those are key elements to keep in mind drilling in a little bit more detail into the business analysis and business intelligence system. Um, we, we can get some more detail by looking at just those things that relate to the system itself, not necessarily uh, much detail on the systems that it interacts with, but as a general level, what does it look like? Doing so lets us then be able to determine the attack surfaces that are associated with each of those subcomponents within the system. And pretty much anywhere that you have a line, you would probably start thinking of it as a potential attack surface. Whenever we talk about things like business analytics, we need to think of them as something that fits into a larger enterprise architecture. They're not something that is isolated unto themselves. Their very nature involves them potentially touching in some capacity pretty much every element in the company. So it is something that to be uh, very seriously uh, evaluated from a risk perspective because it can have significant risk. So if we look at the five major components of the system, we have the, the actual data analysis processing, we have reporting module, uh, we have data gathering module, uh, and we have agents that are co-located within the target deposit uh, or target repositories. So these are basically small pieces of code typically that run either on the, the servers themselves where they're going to be retrieving data from or close to them so that they have access to them. Uh, the, this sort of architecture also continues to exist in the cloud. Uh, there's uh, inside of Azure, for example, there's something called a data management gateway that is an agent that is installed within the network of uh, a particular uh, source system with the intent of enabling access to that system. So very much relevant even in today's architectures. Uh, and they're oftentimes, as this says, co-located with the target repositories. And then the, typically there's some sort of management console that lets you control the entire thing. The, the part of this that's really kind of a con concerning from a security perspective is making sure that the processing storage is very secure because the data that is being uh, potentially retrieved may actually be stored somewhere closer to it rather than retrieved real time. That introduces a potential uh, threat uh, of, of compromise that essentially is putting literally all of the eggs in one basket, as we say, meaning that all of the data may actually be aggregated into a central location. We talk about attack surfaces. Uh, so where, where might they be? Um, so it's you, you always want to consider things that are trusted and untrusted networks. For example, maybe you're ingesting data with one of the agents from an untrusted network. That may very well happen in situations where the data may be important to the organization, but not necessarily to the level of, uh, of security that's required for some other systems. So you want to definitely pay attention to that sort of thing. The management console, would that be considered a, a a attack surface well, most definitely because somebody might uh, be able to get onto that and if they gain access to the, the management console well then they may be able to do something like turn the ingestion processes into an extraction process and send them someplace outside of the organization so there's there's always concerns with those sort of systems a little more detail um, access controls in the management console itself, auth authentication and authorization are typically going to be done by some other uh, system. Uh, most of the time that stuff is not built entirely inside of itself, but if it were to be, then it becomes very important. But this is hinting that there's probably going to be some sort of identity services in the mix, either something like an Active Directory or maybe some sort of federated authentication and authorization. But these sort of things become very important whenever we start looking into uh, 
this is a potentially uh, the the management console may be potentially a very um, tar <laughs> target rich sort of thing, right? So it may be something that is highly important. Uh, both it may have several vulnerabilities, and it may be very much of interest to someone wanting to get access to it. Drilling in a bit more on the attack surfaces. So we've talked in the past about things like SQL injection. So what if somebody were to, to uh, take over uh, uh, one of the uh, potentially vulnerable data sources and somehow inject some data in it that allowed it to, to potentially gain access that it should not have, some sort of, of, of uh, turning ingestion into essentially uh, some sort of means of extracting information and for data gathering purposes. So there are several sort of best practices we do when we're doing this sort of stuff. And it's kind of all about role-based access, right? So if you've got something that is about processing, uh, then it only can write, it can't read. Uh, if you've got something that's about ingestion, then it can only read and it can't write uh, and so on. So the basic idea here is that you restrict those services to the things that they should only be able to do. And in fact, oftentimes inside of a, an ingestion pattern, um, you might not even be able to see the things that you've previously written, that they even exist. It may look like uh, essentially an empty repository, for lack of a better word. And that pattern is to ensure that you can only do that which is necessary. So in the case of maybe you're, you're uploading files into a, a drop zone so that it can be processed by some other system, after you've uploaded the file, you won't see that file name listed in the directory potentially because uh, you don't have permissions to even see the listing of files. So the, the point of all that is to make sure that the appropriate permissions are set uh, based upon the role of the activity. So going through uh, into detail of the potential um, attack surfaces, so basically just making a list. Uh, so data gathering credential store, now that, that is potentially a very uh, significant uh, surface. What, what that is, is that in order to retrieve data from other systems, you need to know how to authenticate with that system in some capacity. Generally speaking, that account has relatively few permissions, something like read, as it should have, because that's all you're supposed to be doing with it, is reading data. Nonetheless, if somebody were to compromise your credential store, they could potentially have access to things that they should not. So. That's where uh, technology such as Azure Key Vault is utilized to be essentially a, se essentially a secrets store so that you um, put all of your credentials into something that is highly secure. And then based upon who you are, when you're asking if you can get a value, it determines if you're able to see it or not and to get the, re the results or not so that you don't ever certainly store something like credentials in a plain text file or, and never store them unencrypted or in the clear. Uh, so that that's definitely one that is significant. Uh, data source credential inputs, so where you actually put that information in. Data gathering from sources, business analytics message bus listeners, because if someone were to be able to listen in on a message bus and listen to everything, then they've pretty much just compromised a large portion of, of an organization. Analytics uh, result store, analytics result presentation, so how it is you actually show that. Uh, configuration files and, and system metadata, pretty much any time you have something that is being used to control the operation of a system, that is very much an attack surface. So anytime that you're persist, persisting things either to disk or to some sort of data store, think of that as an attack surface. The management input console, because somebody might try to get in there. Uh, the configuration files, uh, configuration outputs that come from that management console, and again, maybe uh, those outputs should be in something that's pretty secure as well. Uh, the host on which the management console runs, uh, processing module input from data gathering, processing input from the reporter, whatever commands it's doing, uh, a processing uh, module configuration file. Again, pretty much any kind of config file is going to be a serious concern. And that's part of why as a, an architect, if you're designing a system, you should be designing it with as few configuration sources as possible, ideally one, uh, but if, uh, and that one most likely isn't going to be a file on a disk. Sometimes you have to have two because you may need some means of saying, here's where you go to get your information, but you certainly don't want to scatter configuration files across the disk.
data gathering module uh, configuration files that go with that um, and inputs especially from data sources data source agents uh, communication with data sources so anytime something is talking to something else that communication mechanism be it uh, a network connection or whatever it is needs to be seriously considered as a uh, an attack surface reporting module user interface reporting module configuration file and the business analytics activity and event log files and likely there are additional ones so keeping in mind we have all these risks out here, so what do we do about it? And a mitigation strategy is not necessarily a way to make something go away, but make it to where it's acceptable so that you manage that risk in such a way that it can be uh, dealt with without compromising the, the usability of, of the, essentially the system. So you want to ask questions like who should have these privileges, how many people really need these per permissions, and so on. Um, you don't want to make things totally um, simple. Uh, it should be no more complex than it need be, but don't make it to where certainly the simplest solution is give everybody administrative access, right? That's the simplest, but that's not by any means the best. Administrative controls can be quite challenging inside of an analytics environment. Part of the challenge there is uh, the, the general sort of restriction, as the first sentence says, is about need to know. But the trouble you have is that some of the sometimes the people that are doing certain types of research need to know a lot of different things. But also, though, that need to know is often fairly temporal. So they may need to know it this week, but next week they don't. So having a, an approach that allows them to both be uh, con, you know, productive in their efforts, but also by making sure that the right people only see things there's a business justification to see. And it may be around some sort of exploration of access so that um, you can get to it when you need to, and then it goes away. There's also, Super user rights shouldn't be used whenever you're dealing with business analy analytics environments. Generally speaking, it doesn't work that way. Um, and you you may want to separate out things by functional unit. In this case, it's saying that the reporting module reads its own configuration file. Uh, that may make sense because having it have access to something other than what it needs, probably not a, a good idea. So the basic idea is to think of how to isolate it such that each one of the individual elements of a system can do what they need to do and that the users of the system can also do what they need to do. Using um, some sort of corporate directory and authorization via group membership is typically the go-to for uh, mitigation strategies, especially when you're dealing with access to systems and so on. Generally speaking, the way it works is that a user is a member of a group that group is, has permissions to utilize a system or not uh, and so you don't grant an individual access to a system you you grant the group they belong to access to it and the group is based upon business need or role so you may have a group of, of various people that have uh, access to a given set of reports perhaps even but very rarely, if ever, would you want to allow a given user's identity have direct access to something. You use groups as a means to do that. Um, given all that, it's still possible that there may be some additional things that need to be put in place to secure things. But whenever selecting tools, such as, as I mentioned previously, things like Azure Key Vault, one of the key things about Key Vault is that it does rely on things like group membership and permissions. So those sort of aspects are, are essential when you're selecting tools for your actual implementation. Moving on to requirements. Um, we've done a lot of, of discussion of things, but what do you actually need to do? So uh, in order to prevent an attacker from obscuring 
an attack or otherwise spoofing or fooling the system, monitoring the business analytics activity and event log should only be readable by the security monitoring system. And that's going to be a general guideline of most things. Don't let systems, don't let everybody have access to log files, right? And the log file permissions should be set such that only event producing modules of the business and analytics system may write to its log files. So you don't want just somebody else to come in and utilize the, the logs. And, and in fact, this is also another example of why you might want to use a more robust and mature uh, sort of solution rather than log files. You probably want something that at very least is something equivalent to Windows Event Log, if not something a bit more robust, such, such as um, uh, Application Insights or Log Analytics inside of the Azure world. Although it is true that super users are most uh, operating systems can read and, and write any file, uh, attackers would have to gain these high uh, privileges before they could alter the log files. So what you're trying to, to prevent is them coming in, attacking a system, and then removing their evidence of that attack. And you do that by ensuring that the system itself can only produce events. It cannot delete them or remove them. And part of that is why files might not be a good idea, although you could certainly do that by having the system write to a certain directory in which it only has permissions to create files. It might not even be able to see that those files exist. So if someone were to compromise the identity of that system, they still wouldn't be able to do anything really meaningful. So table 8.1 on the next slide summarizes additional security requirements that uh, would be needed to implement uh, in order to achieve security. Uh, uh, posture requirements for the sensitive information, uh, business intelligence, and analytics system. So here's a rough table that, that outlines all those requirements that would typically be in place. This is not necessarily going to be a, a complete listing, but it gives you an idea of the categories of the items that might be in place and how you would want to document them. Uh, and ensure that this then would turn into lower level requirements that were actually implemented in some way or another. So we come to the conclusion of chapter eight. We talked a bit about um, how we would approach uh, the analysis of a business intelligence system. So the architect or peer reviewing architect team must decide the scope of the risks, possible impact consequences. The scope of the impact dictates at what level of the organization risk decisions must be made. The decision makers must have sufficient organizational decision making authority for the impacts. For, exa for example, if the impact in confined is confined to a particular system, then perhaps the managers involved in building and using the, that system would have sufficient decision making risk, uh, over this scope of the risks. Uh, if the impact is to the, an entire collection of teams underneath a particular director, then she or he must make that, de that risk decision. So basically all we're saying through all this is that whenever it comes to deciding who decides, it depends upon who's responsible at the end of the day. So if it is a departmental impact, then it is the department manager or perhaps their manager, depending upon the severity. If it is an organizational impact, then you're talking CEO, if not uh, potentially the board of directors, because if it's significant to that degree, then it needs to be both. The, the, they all need to be informed, whoever it is, is making this decision so that they can make the appropriate decision. And then and secondly, there needs to be authorization to enable that to happen. And lastly, accountability usually follows as well. So with that, we've completed our discussion of chapter eight. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. That's what I'm here for. Stay safe and I'll talk with you next week.